for so hello everyone and welcome back to the one point safety show with myself scott hartley and my co-host scouse andy how are you scouse you're right mate yeah i'm good man very excited for today's pod so am i i'm extremely mm -hmm. excited so we are honored to be joined by the host of the burgundy zone kyle ronick thanks for joining us kyle Obviously, Boys, always... it is a pleasure, pleasure to be here. It's been a long time since we last saw each other here in the States mm. at uh, at good old FedEx and going out playing pool. But it's always a pleasure to be able to talk ball with you boys. You know, I know you guys have been working hard at this for a long time. And uh, so it's an honor and a pleasure you guys invited me on here. Oh, no, thank you. Well, well this no, is the month you, we're using. We're calling it our American takeover. But we're going to get some of our uh, American friends on their, from their pods. to tell Us, us Americans, we'd never yours. do that. We, no, we'd never on, do man. that. Come on, man. You know it. You know we've taken it. We've taken over enough pods as it is. But yeah, it's time to. It's time you guys return the favor. Not just pods. So, yeah, yeah. But... Not just pods. So Kyle, you are the award-winning Burgundy Zone podcast host. Um, do you want to just give us a little bit of a background on yourself, on how you got started, where you've come from? Because there might be people out there who listen to us that don't necessarily listen to you guys. Yeah, um, we started out actually as the K&M 395, uh, 495 Sportscast, um, but we decided, Reed and I, after doing it for about a year or so, we decided that we were going to change course and change our name um, because it just didn't feel like us and what we wanted to really do. Um, so I came up with the Burgundy Zone, and the reason for that was a play on words with the Red Zone, you know, you being in the Red Zone scoring, but changing that to the Burgundy Zone. But it was also we – thought about this and we said it'd be smart because i know snyder has said he's never going to change the name but i don't trust him so just in case he does that let's do it more based on color and so that's why we did the burgundy zone and it just fit all those layers and uh we kicked off from there we kept doing it it wasn't until covid came around it wasn't until we met the uk boys until andy burroughs scott hartley uh ian bacon uh, until like things started rapidly progressing you know um we weren't getting a lot of views and I'm not going to lie to you, it wasn't like we were um, excited about that. But I knew that we needed something for the guys to believe in, that we were actually building in something. And so I tried to, I just worked really hard in being able to get some guests and stuff that would come on the podcast that would excite them. And at that time, that's when things built. And then COVID came around and we won the best fan podcast award. The, the team, the commanders, did this random fan awards and luckily enough, we were able to win it. Andy's podcast was in the running with it, it was phenomenal. Big Doug show. Uh, and then Freddie Ham, obviously Andy Burroughs is co-host on the bunker. Uh, him and Maddie Jane's podcast at that time were also in the running, which was, it's such an honor to be in with those guys because we had gotten so close through the podcasting world, just getting, just being friends with Andy. And obviously you guys, it was very easy to root for you guys, but luckily enough, dude, we won. And, and it's kind of just crazy because my son was born that same weekend. And so it wasn't like I never really had time to chill and really <laughs> embrace it. But it's been a whirlwind, man. And to this point where last like we when we got into this, we said to each other, we we're like, could you imagine being able to to interview a, a Washington player in person? Like, just imagine that, how incredible that would be. And yeah, Zoom is cool. And we haven't even had a Washington player as a guest yet in Zoom let alone uh, in person. But that happened last year at the draft party. And uh, we got to interview John Allen, Logan Thomas, Kendall Fuller. And it was a dream come true, to say the least. And so just the transformation of this organization from where it was before to now, um, I think a lot of it runs through the fans. And I think that the content creators is a good indication of the transformation of the team uh, from an organizational standpoint. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. And um, just mm -hmm. got a quick question for you, Kyle. Have you ever been starstruck by a pod guest or an appearance that you've had, even if it was in person at the stadium, which we saw you do, or on your pod itself on your show? Um, I would say I was probably awestruck with Morgan Moses, um, because that was our first Washington player when we got him. And I remember Reed had commented he right after we got off with him, he was like, dude, my hands are shaking. You know, just like <laughs> that nerve wracking kind yeah. of thing like i'm not gonna lie to you before some of those guests like i was praying dude like i was like i hope he comes like i hope he shows up i hope like everything is good there's no audio problems like i would pray before those and so yeah those the washington players are definitely ones that really get to you and there's there's still a couple more that would probably you know unnerve me uh if we cool. had the chance to but jonathan allen though i'm not gonna lie to you 
we were cool as a cucumber, man. I mean, like we, like I personally, I wasn't, nice. I think, I don't think I had time to be nervous. We got to the stadium and we got there late. So Jonathan Allen is coming in to in, sit down for interviews and we're just setting up our audio equipment. So I had to get all of that situated, all of that ready by the time that Jonathan Allen came over and thank the Lord that we did nick of time. No, that's nice. really cool. Nice, man. So we've Je- got... jealous, man. Jealous. Oh. We're never going to get that kind of look, are we? To be fair, because obviously dead, dead we're jealous, but we, where we, we are. You know, based... You're lying about oh. that, absolutely, because they've talked about <laughs> you know possibly opening up a European division in the NFL. So you, that time is coming, and yeah. you guys will be the first on the list, dude. Come on now. I hope so. I you guys, so. you guys, yeah, got, crossed. you got escorted around FedEx by Jason Wright. That's true. That's true. That's it's true. Very true. Yeah, that's true. It's like, and that's something that we can take away that fans will ne- probably a lot of fans will never get. So yeah, absolute yeah, shout out again to Boris for, that, for for organising that. So we've got a bit of news this week. They're not a huge amount, but we've got two confirmed bids. Obviously, <clears> the Harris Rails and Magic Johnson Group. And we've also got um, Steve A. I'm going to call him because I can't pronounce his name, and every time <laughs> I do, I butcher it. Um, and we've seen Magic Johnson on the TV openly talking about the bid um, and his excitement around the bid. Um, what are your thoughts on that then, Scouts? What do you think's um, going on with this? Is this a play on him saying, look, come on, Dan, the bid's in, we're trying to get this done? Or is it more of a case of he's just excited about the the fact that they've got a bid in there and it's a wait and see game? I think a little bit of, I think there's definitely an element of that, but I, I also think he's trying to hurry Dan along just a little bit too. It's like, look, man, we've, we've got our money here. Let's go. And and we've heard that Dan's trying to keep pushing it and delaying it and delaying it. So there must be a reason for that. And it's more than likely waiting for Bezos to come in, I think. So uh, rather than accepting the actual, the bid of what's on there at the moment, because both of them are the same. I think um, Steve A, as you call him, he's still f- trying to find that kind of extra bit of cash at the moment. He hasn't got a, a true full-on bid. That's the same as, as the Rawls group. So, I think, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, I just don't like, I just don't understand why Magic Johns is even involved, to be fair. I mean, I just don't, I don't get it, personally. He's not, he's not a football guy, you know. I get he's a big name in basketball. I, I get it, but it's just kind of like, come on, man. Zero experience in the NFL. Why should he be part owner? That's, that's my thing, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, it's just my thing. Kyle, any thoughts yeah, on that? For, for the... I just want to be honest, really, for the most part, I do not care about the ownership of the team. Like I, I've never cheered for a suit. Like I'm not going to do that here. Um, I just care about the football team. I do care about when a suit like has a makes an issue on the football field, you know, with decisions and whatnot. But I will say that I think Scouse is hundred percent right about the magic Johnson and being on us or was it you? No, not USA. Today. It was, yeah. It Good was, morning, it America. Was yeah. yeah, it was. I thought it was USA Today, but yeah. I think it was Good Morning America. But look, him being on there, I think Scouse is absolutely right where he's like, let's imagine like you're buying a car, right? And you make an offer to the dealership for this car. And the dealership says, wait, wait, I just want to be open to what these other people are offering as well. You don't want that. You want the car. So you're like, no, man, come on, let's go. Let's push this along. I'm trying to get the car. I don't want it to be open to somebody else possibly taking it. And I think that's where Magic Johnson is coming across. I, I do think Bozos uh, has a lot to do with that, um, and to Andy's point uh, with it. But I, I honestly, with the Canadian guy as well, uh, Steve A, I think is uh, a pull polls. Not really sure. Apost- 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 Apostolopolis? Yeah, yes, exactly. that something, like right. that, something like that. Mm. That's that why sound, that sounds it. smart. That sounds smart. It's probably, it. teeth That's probably it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, but with him, you don't really know all that much. I do know a little bit about Rails, uh, who would be part of the Harris ownership group. Um, him doing the National Gallery of Art, kind of investing in that. And that's a site that I worked on. I could tell you that that was very precise, very clean. Like that's if that's the type of thing that we're gonna be dealing with with Washington, it's probably a good thing for everyone involved. And then with Magic Johnson, I think that he just brings an extra element given that what he has in pool with the NBA, whereas the NBA, like the commanders already, if you follow their Twitter account, they have a lot of connections to the wizards. They have had a strong connection for the past couple of years. And so um, that's not a bad thing, especially building it here in the DC area. And magic Johnson is certainly somebody who can do that. I'm holding out hope that uh, Michael Jordan is somehow going to stick his finger in here. I'm um, being able to do it. Uh, probably a poor use of words there, but I would love for him to be involved here. Just to have, go from Dan Snyder to Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan, the two MJs, that would be incredible. 
So we're still waiting the uh, awaited bid from Jeff Bezos, um, which Tony Gasparino is constantly talking and talking and talking on Twitter about. But don't believe anything at all. Blue check marks can be bought these days. If it doesn't come from <laughs> Ian Rappaport or Schefter, it's right. not real. Um, you know, you've got to, you've got to look at the... Mm-hmm. Or Kime, exactly that. That's who I would go to. So we're still awaiting that bid, but I take it you would prefer then, as you just talked about, the local group, if you like, for the, the Harris, the Rails and Magic Johnson, who are all local dudes who get it, understand what the history of the franchise is all about. They've been brought up in the area. Um, so I take it you would prefer that to a Jeff Bezos, because um, obviously Jeff has got the liquid assets and money to buy this, fund the stadium, hand in with the politicians potentially around trying to get RFK, all the site deals, etc. cetera. Um, but are you happy with having local guys who understand the franchise or would you just want Jeff Bezos at the last minute? You know, I'll put an extra hundred million in and off you go. It's yours. I'd go local all day, mm-hmm. just dealing with the demographic, um, knowing about the control aspect of Snyder, knowing that that is what deprived us from winning for so long. I think that that is very important here. And I feel like Bezos is the type of person that is a control freak to an extent and will manipulate over time, whether that it provides in good winning football or not. Um, I just don't really trust it all that much, especially from the get-go, because I want to be able to see what has been built here, actually established and show success in the NFL. The last thing I want is Bezos to come in and implode the entire thing because he wants to show that his way is better and he'll show you how to get it done kind of thing. But the local all day, honestly, and I don't really care because it's just another suit, just money to come in. But I'm happy that it's a good light for this franchise because like they haven't had hope in a long time. And a lot of every single time that we had hope with Shanahan with Scott McLuhan type stuff, it got ripped away. And so because of Snyder. And so in this sort of instance, the seeing that light and hope come back is very important in my opinion. Well, it can't can't be much worse, can it? Let's face it. I mean, this guy is the ultimate scumbag. So I am, um, I'll be very happy whoever gets it to be fair, as long as it's not Dan Snyder. And as long as RG3 is not involved either, (laughs) because I still think that he's part of the Dan's, part of Dan's little, uh, he'd be his kind of little, uh, you know, little stooge that's still in there. So he's still got his claws into the team. So I don't want anything to do with RG3 involved at all. I mean, I respect so, RG. I really do. And what he did as an athlete, what he's doing as a media oh, yeah. person. But like, you know how I am. I like to be local. And look, you were drafted by Washington, but by no means are you a Washington native. Are you a Baltimore native? Yeah, you spent some time here. But we all know you like the media. You want to be out West. You want to be in Texas. That's what you like doing. Last look, I RG3 it can't possibly love anybody else more than himself, in my personal opinion. And that's not the type of person we want to bring in here. It's just the way I feel. I've had enough of because that argument has literally existed since 2012. I'm ready to get away from it. It started a race war. I don't want to go back to it. And it unfortunately for RG3 is that that kind of gets brought back up whenever he is. And that's what's so unfortunate because he is a polarizing figure. He's good at what he does and he's good on social media. And so um, I, I just don't want that sort of thing from the ownership standpoint. I, I just go away, man. Like, don't, don't need <laughs> any away. attention. You don't need any admiration. You don't need your feet kissed. Just go away and just sign the checks. That's all I need, man. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly right. Exactly right. So Tony Wheats asked a question to you, Scouse, is why do, what is your beef with, uh, with Magic Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind, of, I kind of mentioned it. I mean, you know, he's, I, I, first of all, this guy is not rich enough to be the full on owner. So he's just going to be some, some part player, but he's never going to be there. And he's not like he's a superstar coach or superstar NFL player that, that plays that you could actually help, like, you know, somehow get players on board or improve them in any way. He's not really a, that kind of thing. So it's just like, well, so what is he then? So he's not the ultimate businessman where he's like the Rawls or the guys who are making billions. This guy's kind of like a, I don't know. I don't know what he's there for, man. I mean, can I ask Andy a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Andy, (laughs) did you, did you, did you at any point think that Dan Snyder had an implication on players signing here or fans getting tickets? An implication? Do you mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, 
Dan, Dan Snyder stops controlled everything, didn't he? Let's face it. Well, my point um, being is that if we don't think that free agents and others would want to come here because of Snyder, then mm. the argument could be made if Magic Johnson is brought in, then players would want to play for one of the best NBA players to ever play the game. Sort of thing is my well, is my well, argument. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, but the thing is, it's like in the days, an NBA dude, he's not an NFL player. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's just like, you know, yeah, he's be right. great. You he's are right. quality. You know, you're an excellent and you no know, legendary basketball player. But at the end of the day, it's like this is NFL now. This is a different league. You know what I mean? This is a different, completely different sport. And I think you know this guy. I, but I think we can all agree that Dan Snyder never played football. No, that's true. <laughs> no, he's a fan, money. Let's face it. I mean, Wait, and then fa- I think that's Snyder, the other argument. Fan Snyder. <laughs> I think that's the other argument. Is like other people will say, well, there's other owners out there that never played football. They're just rich that bought into it. You don't really need to be in the football world. I could understand that argument back, but I absolutely love that Andy is so just doesn't understand it. <laughs> he doesn't. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get so it, man. I just don't get it. He's, he's got a big name, but it's like, why? Why? You, know, you, got no, you got no name. You got no name in the NFL, bro. No name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So this week also, a bit of other news is Ron Rivera had a bit of a media scrum and he talked about roster building, um, obviously into his fourth season now. Um, would you think that was taken out of context? Or did he mean that because you've got a rookie quarterback now that you can better build your roster and maybe he was misinterpreted? I think that a lot of what he's, I think uh, you ask, I think a lot of what he says gets misconstrued. Mm -hmm. And I said this about a year ago um, that I was going to start praying for the coaching staff because I saw that things are going to be sort of pointed a a certain way, a different angle in order to pop a pimple, so to speak. And um, I was concerned about that. And that certainly is what has happened a lot that he gets misconstrued a lot. And I do think that's what happened. I think that Ron Rivera speaks from the heart, but he has to be smart in doing so. So he has to kind of limit himself in what he says. So that's why he'll repeat words a lot. Like when he says guys, like he's trying to make sure that he's getting the right verbiage out without having to cause liability to anything else, like relationships or to players or stoking his hand to the other team, if that makes sense. In this sort of instance, I think that what he was trying to say was, we have for the first time feel good about our roster going into the draft to the point where we don't feel that we have to take a position high up. And I think that's more so as what he was meaning towards, because my whole argument is a lot of people have said that he sits on his hands that he's a dinosaur that the NFL has passed him by that. You see these other teams like the Eagles, the Rams being aggressive, they go and get players, they ship them in here. But then those same fans are the ones complaining about his roster building comment. Well, how is he a dinosaur when he's been roster building for the past three years? But now that he says he's finally roster building, now you have a problem with it. Like saying, oh, now you're roster building? What do you mean? You were just complaining about his roster building for the past three years. Yeah. Come on now. Exactly. You know he was roster building. That's what is probably the most annoying thing about it is everyone knows he's been roster building and that's not what he meant. You know that he's been roster building. <laughs> yeah, it's just exactly. his definition of what he's saying by that is not the same as everybody else's. And Scout, you mentioned this last week. You said this goes back to what you kind of what you talked about on our last pod, where you say sometimes Ron says too much. You know, he's a little too honest. Yeah, he opinion. does. He, yeah, he's a little, little too honest. And sometimes he lets slip a couple of things here and there, little little tip tidbits here and there. Especially if you get him on a good day when he's having a, in a good mood, and you know, uh, you, you can tell when he's pissed off at something because he'll he'll just give you like the sharp, short answer, real short. Where a lot of times, if he's in a in a good mood, or he's much more relaxed. You'll see him. You'll just be like, "Yeah, just talking to you like we're talking now." And sometimes it can let it. Well, doesn't need to hot hot water, but it can get a few little uh, a few little outcries on on social media, shall we call it? It's, Jay Gruden had to go through this. Can you imagine what he would have said? <laughs> I mean, the the media scrum com- with Jay Gruden is butterflies compared to what Ron Rivera has dealt with since he's come here. If we're being honest, where everything he's saying is getting picking picked apart the only time jay gurdon really had to deal with it was during the rg3 and kirk cousins saga yeah is when he was really under the microscope agreed also I mean, talked, he also talked about the fifth year option for chase young and one thing that was mentioned and again as you just said there kyle and you scouse you've both mentioned that it's being brought into the minutia the tiny little details of what ron says and it was mentioned about chase young's health and about his knee and do we read into that as a concern or is this a, a, a nothing statement? You know, I'm not sure. 
again. I'm not me, sure. He was healthy, wasn't he, last year? He was healthy last year. He came out, he played oh. well. He kind of looked like the old Chase Young, especially in that 49ers game. So for me, it's kind of a nothing statement, that, isn't it? I, I think that what they're trying to – they're just – I think they feel – passionately about seeing what they want to see out of chase young and i think that they are trying to use every asset and leverage possible in order to achieve that and i think that this workout in this month for chase young and a lot of guys on this roster is very important to their future and what's going to happen a month from now but when we look at this from a simple aspect they have to pick up the option and the only re and the reason I say that is just talking about the media scrum, the way that this team is viewed, how Ron is viewed, how every question is picked apart. Every move he does is met by annoyance. And that sort of thing, I can understand why he'd have to pick up the fifth year option for Chase Young to kind of validate the pick. Because if he doesn't, what does that say about his, the drafting, right? And I think that he also doesn't want to sever that relationship with chase young like past regimes have done and so i think that if you're looking at it from a simple aspect because i'm a simple man uh no uh no disrespect about it but i think that <laughs> from a simple aspect looking at it it's going to happen they're going to pick up the option scouse any thoughts on that yeah i mean I, I think i think he's totally right kyle i think you know you just can't if this guy's going to be a super if you think he's if you genuinely believe he's going to be the superstar eventually You've got you've got to pick it up, haven't you? You're playing a big risk if, if you if you go, I'll leave that this year, do a Deron Payne type style, and then he balls out, and he could just go, do you know what? I'm worth 28 mil per year, and we're not paying that, and he goes, and then he's gone. So we kind of messed ourselves up. So for me, it's kind of like, is it worth the 17 and a half mil that it'll cost for this fifth year option? I think it's worth it just because of that that, and then obviously if he does ball out, then then we can still pay him still. So. For me, you, you just you just got to do it, man. You just got to bite the bullet and do it. I mean, you've got a lot of money next year coming up, you know, in the cap space. You've got to think it's 108 million in the spare cap next year. So, I mean, what's 17 and a half mil in compared to that? It's not, it's not even right. a drop in the bucket, is it? So, for me, it's got to be done, man. And 190 million in 2025, and that's really? including <laughs> Deron Payne's contract. Yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. I mean, you know. So there is a way then to keep all five, really. No you can franchise tag Montez yeah. oh, Sweat yeah. next year, and then you can look to get that long-term deal. Um, big shout-out to uh, Meese21, uh, Meese Brandon Ryan Bold, who submitted a question. I hope we've answered your question there on what we would do with Chase Young and what we think the team is going to do with Chase Young. So, um, yeah, thanks for writing into us and uh, tweeting us, Brandon. We really appreciate that. My man, um, Brandon. He is. He's, he's a cool dude, man. He's he's always in my DMs. So, yeah, what a good guy. Um, we've also had the top 30 prospect steady, visits this steady. week. Nah, come on. We've had, a, <laughs> we've had our uh, top 30 prospect visits this week, um, and they're still ongoing today. Today we had a Cyrus Torrance guard from Florida. We've also been and had a visit with Hendon Hooker, and we've had Anthony Richardson as well. Um, any thoughts on that at all, Kyle, on who... Are we looking to draft? Are we looking? Because there's been quarterbacks there. There's been a lot of talk around quarterbacks. Or do you think they're just doing their due diligence now and getting these guys in to see exactly where they are? Oh, yeah, this is 100% due diligence. I don't think it is an indication that they want to draft these guys. I think this is more so of an indication of them having questions about these guys and certain things that have happened. And so they want more information, and that's why they schedule these meetings and top 30 visits and or so. I do. I'm not going to say what I think is the real indicator of where they feel like they're going to go in the draft because I could be horribly wrong. But all I'll say is we should go back and look at years previous and see if there are any parallels, if there are already mm -hmm. similarities, if there's any underlying uh, common factors there. And I think that would be more of an indicator there. And I do think I have an eye. My mindset of where it could possibly be. But I'm going to keep that to myself until draft yeah. day uh, until okay. to talk about it. But I, I, I'm just really excited for this draft because we have no idea what's going to happen. Like, yeah. especially these quarterbacks. Like, Hendon Hooker, I think, is a very good talent. Played at Virginia Tech. I absolutely love him. He tore his ACL, obviously, but he still has a little bit ways to go. But he's the type of guy that has four years of experience, was highly productive in his two years at Tennessee. So it's not like he only has one year of experience, one year of good year, like Anthony Richardson and other guys that have come out. But that injury pushes him back. And he could possibly be one of the best quarterbacks in this draft. And so I feel like this draft in particular is very, very 
uh, up in the air because it, at any point in time, this thing can shift and somebody can make a, a move with like Bijan Robinson and all of a sudden things yeah. explode. Agreed. Any thoughts on the 30 top 30 visits, Scouts? Well, Are you I, still I just, sticking with I mean, cornerback and lineman? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll go into that in a sec. But I mean, from from kind of what one tends to do around draft time, he's, he's all smoke and mirrors, man. That's what he does all the time. It's kind of like, oh, we're going to believe you're going to go down this route and, and you just complete 180 at the time of the draft. So, like, as you mentioned with Jahan Dotson, you know, he, did, he, did, he didn't meet him, he didn't speak with him, didn't do anything because he already knew all about the guy because he just spoke to everybody else around him. So, and just he just took us completely away. We were thinking, no way, he's taking Johanna 16 here. And then he did, you know. So, so and that's the kind of thing that, that Ron does. He likes to do that and he's very good at it as well. So I think a lot of this, you know, um, exactly. It's all, it's, it's, a lot of it's mind games and, and for show, uh, especially if like, like with Hooker, for example. I mean, yeah, I, I totally agree with Carl. He's, he, he looks like a really good quarterback. A little older. He's, I think he's 25, I think, coming up for the, when the season starts. A little, little old for a rookie quarterback, but you still get, you know, still get quite a good few years out of him, you know. But in saying that, Minnesota looking, have been looking at him as well. So it's kind of like, ah, well, we're. I think they're at twenty three. I think I could be wrong with that with um, with the Vikings. But they're looking at Hendon yeah. Hooker there, and we're like, ha, we're sixteen. We're looking at him, huh? You know what I mean? And just trying to make them trying to think and keep thinking, thinking, thinking. Do we need to go up? Do we need to do this? Do we even trade with us? So those things are there, and, and it's it's just dead smart mind games from all of them, to be fair. And really Minnesota is. could be doing the same thing because the Saints <laughs> met with Hendon Hooker, who sit at 29. So maybe the Vikings want the Saints to <laughs> trade up to 23. You know, like everyone is doing this, mm. and that's why mm. you really just kind of throw your hands up, and you're like, I mm. can't wait for draft night. <laughs> yeah, so true, man. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Oh, yeah, and speaking of uh, Richardson, man, I, I, was, I, was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a Gators fan from, from college, and He's got all the measurables, but his accuracy absolutely sucks, man. I mean, honestly, he should not even be in the first round. Being honest, you're right. He, being honest, like you know, he's just not. I mean, even even in even in the combine, I mean, obviously he measured off the scale, but with his accuracy, he couldn't even throw it to guys who are wide open. See what I mean? Like he was. You know, so for me, this guy he needs two two years minimum before he's trying to even start that dude. He should never be in the top five, which is what some people are projecting he might go. I think it's insane. I mean, this guy should same. Be, that was me know. last year with Malik Willis, my dude. I, I feel the same exact way. I feel like the only reason that he is a first-round quarterback is because those first-round picks have that fifth-year option. So a team mm -hmm. is going to say, I want to – even though he's a second-round talent, I want to take him the first because that extra year is so valuable. But I've been saying, I think the best place that Anth – Anthony Richardson would be a Hall of Fame quarterback if he was drafted by the Bills. If he were to back up Josh Allen and kind of adopt that quarterback centric offense where he's the running game, he's also the passing game with some electric guys outside. I feel like he could groom into a Hall of Fame quarterback. But if he gets drafted by Carolina, or one of these teams and thrusted in right away and told make it work, I feel like he something's going to go bad, either his play or an injury or some sort. And I'm concerned about that. So. We'll move on then to our next uh, segment of the show, which is my favourite segment every week. It is Scouse's sizzle. Do you mm. have a sizzle this week, Scouse? Oh, not, not massively. But I'm, I'm just gonna have a, I'm just gonna have a little sizzle at Kyle here for not letting us on his show. You got a shrimp sizzle? <laughs> yeah, small barbecue. You know what I mean? One of them. So it's kind of like, look, Kyle, why aren't you, why aren't you bringing us on your, your pod enough? What's going on, man? <sighs> It's hard. What is going on, bro? It's hard. Scheduling. <laughs> it's a scheduling issue. <clears throat> scheduling. Yeah, yeah. No, I also, I also. Nah, he's too very, good for us, man. He's too good I, for I'm us. I'm very smart about the way that I go about it, especially with with guests like this. So you have to understand that I want the best for you, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to schedule it around our mountain times, if that makes sense, because you have some valley times that comes around. You know, you can see it. It happens. But there are times where there are mountains and you got to trust me. <laughs> I'm going to put you in the best mountain range possible. You got to trust oh, so me. Is, is that a bit like EB with his uh, put me the best position to win type of thing and become yes, the best absolutely. player as possible? Something like I that. Trust yeah. I got okay. I got a plan. I got a plan. Andy. Boy, I always do. He's got, he's got a plan. I like that. I like yeah, okay. That. So I got we'll a plan for everybody. I got a plan for case. Scott too. <laughs> we'll move on to our, uh, our fan <laughs> questions then. And we'll go. We'll, we'll go. We'll go with these. So, um, 
Pascal, all right, let's have a look at this. So we've already asked. Yeah, so here you go, Kyle, one for you then. So Brandon Reinbold again asks, do you think we've improved with our off-season moves? Or do you think the proof is going to be with the draft class? I do think that we have improved because if you look at this last season, Andrew Norwell, this was before the injury, obviously that you're looking at it as, Oh, that's a starting guard. Now you're going to look at him now and say, that's probably a below average starting guard with that injury. Obviously we don't know if he's gotten better or not, but at this point he's not starting because Andrew Wiley was brought in because these other guys like Nick Gates were brought in to possibly start at left guard. And so that kind of makes it so he's more of a depth piece, which obviously elevates everyone else because now you have more talent at your depth piece. You're not falling off a cliff in that aspect. And then in regards to Cody Barton, I absolutely loved the fit with Cody Barton after Logan Paulson explained it to me. When he said that Cody comes in with the different strength of Jamin, of John Bostic, of David Mayo and others. Whereas he is more so geared toward the passing game, not very good against the run. Whereas last season we had a bunch of linebackers that were just good against the run. And so where they, where could you eat us up in the middle of the field? And then that's where Cam Curl came in from his injury. He came back in the middle of the field and they couldn't target that anymore. They had to go out and our defense kind of morphs and change from that aspect. Uh, so I think that we have gotten better because this now gives us more range. And like Ron Rivera said, these moves aren't like they're, they're paying them to start, right? Like these are more depth, just adding more confidence, I guess you could say. Whereas when you're going into the draft, you can draft and go ahead and get the best player available. It doesn't matter. You're going to find a place for them. And that's where the genius comes in of being the versatile piece of Nick Gates and Andrew Wiley, where you can draft a center, you can draft a guard or a tackle, and they can, they're interchangeable. They can go to any of these spots to put your best five out there possible. So, yeah, Brandon, I think that we have gotten better. Now, quick question really? for you there, Kyle, before we go on. Like, I'm a big fan of uh, Sean Michael Schmitz, and I've obviously I've asked you a couple of questions about him in your pods over the, over the weeks. Mm. Um, I, I my comp is his like his actual kind of ceiling could be Jason Kelsey. I think. I mean, do you think he could be that kind of quality center? Or Definitely. Am I way reach. Oh, my reaching. No, you're not reaching at all. I think that he does mm -hmm. offer that. He he offers you the exact fundamentals you want out of a center, almost robotic, but not like athletically robotic is not what I mean, but more so he knows where to put his hands. He knows where to have the leverage in his hips. He's not going to be beaten. You know, like he, he's not the type of dude you're going to see him get thrown onto the ground. He's not going to get pulled over, but he's also not doing that to the other guy. He's doing his job. He's going to turn them. He's going to turn their hips in the run game. He's going to block with low leverage in the passing game. He's not going to get bull, to, bull rushed over. But he also does have limitations in his athleticism where if you pull him out on sweeps and other stuff like that, he's not going to be quick in getting out there to the edge. But he offers you, I think the best way to explain it is saying that he has the highest floor. I Meaning like at his worst, he is higher at his worst than any other center prospect if that makes sense, at their worst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that starting ability and that kind of solidified rock of him is what gives makes him so intriguing and could be a first-round talent because somebody's going to say, I can plug and play this guy right away, and I know that he, the way that he plays, I don't have to teach him up all that much. And that's sort of the kind of thing that you want in the NFL. You don't want headaches. You don't want that, and that's what's comfortable to the team. So uh, Jason, the Kelsey thing, it's just hard to say that because they are two different players, and Kelsey is obviously phenomenal. Um, and John Michael Schmitz has that opportunity to do so, but he also has to be put in a good situation, you know. So, so do you think it's a little bit of a stretch? Let's get them at sixteen then. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say it's a stretch because, like, you have to look at it and saying, where does the talent meet meet where we need it, and where does it have in the draft order? Like, we can talk all day that John Michael Schmitz is a second round talent. That's not what the scouts are telling them. We have no idea what they think. They could have John Michael Schmitz as the 10th rank, 10th rank player, and they could be slapping hands in the war room after they get him at 16. Well, we're all crying and confused. You know, you, it's, you never know. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's Adrian, the draft all Adrian. over. So I've got one for you, Scouts, then. This is from Christian Burt, who does uh, UK HTTR blogs. So if you uh, Google search UK yeah, no, Christian. Yeah, he does no, good articles. He does do yeah, really he's good. good I like Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good guy. 
He asks, is EB getting more attention than most OCs that we've seen in the NFL? I think, well, I, th- I think yes, to a certain extent there, because let's face it, he's coming from a winning organisation. He's, he's coming from the Andy Reid tree, uh, 10 years of working at Kansas City, five years under under Reid. You know, his, 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 um, his actual resume is unbelievable, to be fair. I mean, and then, then all of a sudden you add that, the way you should have had all the, all the controversy of him not actually being a head coach yet. And then you stick him over into into the the, the, the cauldron of Washington media and how big no this is nation's capital by the way do you know what I mean so there's all there's gonna be, there's there's gonna be loads of media attention on him and and the, I think they're just trying to build him up so if he falls they can rip him that, that's why that's what I think they're gonna knock him down I just hope that he you no know, he, he hits the ground running really so the media can't get on this case but it's it, he's got to hit the ground running but definitely hundred percent of the question hundred percent. Uh, he's definitely getting a lot more attention than other of offensive coordinators around the NFL. Yeah, I agree completely with that. So I've got this one, and Mike Reed from your show, Kyle, asks, oh, no. last year, <laughs> <laughs> bated breath there, I saw that. Last year, most people didn't expect a DT in round two of the draft. What position could you guys see the commanders taking early that's not talked about much? Well, for me, I think this is, um, we're looking at a D end. I think, you know, a defensive end is something that we've talked about there. We have two prized defensive ends who are due contract very soon. We've got to think about Chase Young's fifth year option. We've also got to think about re-signing Montez Sweat. There's a lot of money invested in the DTs already. And that front seven is going to be heavily, heavily invested in. Um, We've already just talked there about cap space and ways around that we can do it. But I could see a defensive end that isn't being talked about a lot. A Brian Branch, maybe somebody like that, that's, that could come in around sixteen, or even if you traded back slightly. Defen- the defensive end, or are you talking? Well, to he's a safety. Is he a safety? I thought he played. He's, safety. he's a DB. Yeah, yeah, okay. DB. Mm-hmm. So who are they the top rated? Right he's good. I mean, he, who, to be to be fair, I mean, to be fair, you stole my position with with defensive okay. end uh, because of the situations with Chase and Montez, mm-hmm. um, but. To be fair, I, next one was safety, so, so I was going to think about kind of with, with Brian Branch was going to be my my guy really. So you kind of already got to yeah be off with both of them really there. But uh, for me, I I'll say punt returner. Um, I wow. think that that's one position we could go high, like somebody like Tank Dell, uh, who is absolutely electric as a returner in the punt game. I think that Antonio Gibson has the kick return on lock. I think he's great in that capacity, but I am concerned with him as a punt returner. Uh, so I do think that punt return is something that maybe this team is very, very invested in finding one uh, and being able to replace it because they saw what happened with DeAndre Carter. And they just want to add that extra element of explosiveness and aggressiveness to the special teams to kind of complete the team. I could see them maybe going punt returner in round two. Well, round two. That's going to I'm disappointed in thinking? Reed. I thought that was going to be more sinister. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Normally is that. Maybe He's being nice. Is. Being nice his, his, his alter ego needs to come out more, maybe. Right. There's one for, got one for you then, Kyle. So Martin um, what, Wargan, Wargy, asks, all the talk is about maybe trading down. Is there a chance that we trade up maybe three or four places to snag a top lineman or corner or even possibly a quarterback? And if so, who do you see us getting and what would you give up as compensation? Um, the possibility is always out there to trade up. Uh, it just depends on who falls. Um, but typically, teams do not trade up for a player unless it's a quarterback. You can look back at like Julio Jones, for example. The Atlanta Falcons traded up to take him. Obviously, that was a good reason they did that, right? It ended up bringing them a Super Bowl. But like those types of players, what you're really going to get, and I don't think there's one in this class that will kind of covet that because I feel like these players can fall a little bit and. Ron Rivera has shown that he would rather build with other aspects than go all in on one position in particular. I think that he's been very consistent in saying that in this off season and that they could go in any route and they don't need to do that. And so, but I will say if there was anybody that you'd be doing that for by trading up, the only one in my mind is Christian Gonzalez, the cornerback from Oregon. He is a very good corner. I think that he has the capability of being a lockdown corner. He possesses all the tools that you will need. He's played inside. He's played outside. He's versatile in that breath. So even though that we already have two outside corners, he could start out as your slot and then work his way to the outside in case of emergency or whatever happens in the future. Because as of right now, Kendall Fuller is not going to be our long-term corner looking at this three years down the road. As of now, 
that if you look at it in that breath in three years, this DB group is very thin. And we have to be able to invest in that because this conference, this division, it's getting better with wide receivers and we have to be able to compete with them. And they're big dudes and they can play. And Christian Gonzalez being, I think, 6'2", it can definitely foot the bill. 100%. My, my favorite guy in the whole draft, to be fair, Christian Gonzalez. Uh, so smooth, man. I mean, yeah, watching this guy's in the combine was just like, oh, wow. Like, they, they, there was very good corners with him in there. But when you watch him, it's like unbelievable. Everything just looks so easy that... that he was born for it. Do you know what I mean? Like, like one of those type of dudes. And I just think, like, I mean, if we could get him, I'd be over the moon, even if we did have to trade up. But yeah, I know, you know the argument would be that there's plenty of corners in this draft. There's no yeah, reason but, to trade up for him. Um, but that but level, it, that, yeah, mm, you know what I mean? Like, he's the well, he's the, the one example, A, he's the one A, you know what I mean? Example is Source Gardner, isn't it? I mean, look at how he totally fundamentally changed the Jets on D last year. Yeah, a lot you know of people I mean? will tell so, you he's not as good as Sauce Gardner. And all I'll mm. say is, you don't know what a player will do in somebody else's system. Like he, maybe he's not as good as sauce Gardner, but maybe his first year is as productive as sauce Gardner's in this mm -hmm. defense. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, here's one then for you, Scouse. So Simon Thurston asks, and we'll probably all answer this. He said, we are we missing a trick in being able to bring or uh, being able to snare a gettable elite franchise quarterback in Lamar Jackson or is Ron correct? in not mortgaging the future draft picks for and top talent just for one player. Yeah, mm. I, mean, I think I I mean it's, it's a good question. Um but for me it's I I'm all in on how, you know, so I, I think I mentioned this before. Um you know the the cost of this guy is just too much. It's too much. It's two first rounders and then the two 200 250 million dollar contract he's going to want. It's it would just destroy the whole team. And and, and it because you wouldn't be able to afford to keep your cam curls and the DNs as well. So your defense is just going to fall apart. It's going to be like back to square one rebuilding. And for one guy, and the thing is, like, yeah, okay, is, is, he, a, is he a quality quarterback? Sure, he's a quality quarterback. But for me, as Ron said, he said, well, we're good with roster building still, but that means like he's using the how because obviously his contract is so cheap at this moment. So, and that allows us to pay all our guys and you know go forward from there. I mean, you know, Lamar, Lamar is Lamar is excellent, don't get me wrong, but no, nah, not for me, not for me. If he was a free agent, then maybe, but those two first rounders on top of that, nah, you're okay, I'll pass. For me, I'm pulling the trigger. 100%. You know, we haven't had an elite quarterback. Um, I don't, we don't know what Sam Howe has got. I'm on board with Sam Howe. Absolutely. 100%. If that's the decision. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll answer this. Answer this then, bro. Mm -hmm. Ron is in his last year of his contract. Well, he's got two years left on his contract. However, he, he thinks he's going to be gone. He's even mentioned it himself. Yeah. That, you know, I could be gone at the end of the season. And, mm -hmm. and look what he's doing. He, he's sticking himself to Howe. So that must tell me that he's got, that he's got a lot of confidence in the dude. I mean, you got to think about it. Of kind of like, well, wait there a minute. If we, do, if if we, he, he can easily go. Do you know what? Fuck the rest of them. I'm going to go out and get Lamar, destroy the whole team, and leave next season anyway. He could do that, couldn't he? But no, he wants to do it the proper way to leave leave an actual real team and a real legacy. So for me, I mean, uh, that's why you got to respect Juan Rivera still. Further again, I love Juan Rivera as the man and the, and the person. Just a shame that he's not a great head coach at the time on the field, but you need him to be. <laughs> yeah, and I think that goes back to uh, Christian's question from earlier to uh, to Andy. And I think that Ron Rivera is confident and excited about this offense and this team adding EB here. I think that EB is one of the most exciting OCs to ever be hired, and he should be because it was all talked about him not getting head coaching opportunities. And he should be a head coach. He should be a head coach. Mm -hmm. He's coming off of a team where they are perennial winners, championship winners. And we were able to pry them away. Usually he gets a head coaching job, those sort of guys. You know, we've seen guys just sniff the jock strap of Sean McVay and they get head coaching <laughs> jobs. Eric yeah. Bieniemy is involved in this almost dynasty in a way. And we have gotten him to be OC here, not head coach. OC, where he can capitalize on what he does well and most. He should be talked about more. And he should be the most exciting OC because we now just added one of the best OCs come from the most productive and successful teams in the NFL. We've added him as our OC 
with our DC and Jack Del Rio, who has a top 10 defense. And also we have Ron Rivera kind of holding it all together. That is a elite coaching unit. And I think it's the best in the NFL. Wow. Cool. So, so you still, so after saying that Hartley, do you still want them on? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I just don't think you get these opportunities to go out and find a QB who is elite for that. I'll bring group. you. Can I argue one thing to you? Go on. It's gone. The one argument I always heard with Carson was that Carson Wentz won his MVP back in 2016. He wasn't the same quarterback. I, I think we all said, yeah, I know. We're not saying that he's going to be a quarter uh, MVP, but he has that capability, right? And I think that's a similar aspect to what's going on here with Lamar Jackson yeah. is we keep saying the MVP caliber, but can we guarantee that after these injuries, you're going to get that same production? And I think that that kind of question mark is what has teams kind of being – a little timid about the whole sim, uh, situation, but I also think that the Ravens have this handcuff and there's not much that Lamar can do. And that regardless, even if Lamar took less money for another team, the Ravens would match that contract. Yeah, exactly. And so he's kind of screwed. Yep. I couldn't agree more with you there. I mean, the, the for and the against are, you know, you, you've, you've both made a, a great argument. We've gone back and forth on this for at least three weeks now. Um, for me, if it was in the position of, Money's no object. Absolutely. I'd do it in a heartbeat, but money is not money is, you know, the root of all evil, as they say. And he wants, you know, that guaranteed contract. And we don't know what his injuries are going to be like. So yeah, I agree with you completely. If it was me and I was in that position, I'd probably still do it, but that's just me. <laughs> um, you're not gonna well, you're not gonna this? get me off that train. Scott Snyder. Scott Snyder. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Tony Wheat uh, submitted a few questions for us here. Uh, Kyle, this one's for you. Is there a world where Washington takes a quarterback at 16? Yeah, that world exists. And it's somewhere on a yacht off the coast of Spain or Britain, <laughs> wherever it is. Scott's hanging out with him. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it is. I mean, honestly, yeah. That, that, <laughs> He's that's, living in my garden, I've told you before. That's 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 what Snyder would do. Like that's Tonya, literally you what coming you in do. for tea. Yeah. Sorry, I was just shouting uh, Tonya for tea. But yeah, you're definitely um, you're going for tea, dude. That's so English. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. We we call our uh, our evening meal tea up at up yeah. in the north. <laughs> but there you go. There you go. I need some uh, tea. Scouse, do you think there's a world where we take a quarterback at 16? Yeah, the, the dream world that Dan Snyder's on. That mm. one. Because there's no chance there's realistic, there's no chance we're taking a quarterback at 16. Unless no, like CJ Stroud drops a 16, which is highly, highly unlikely. It's never going to happen. So we're never, we're, ne we're not taking it. Just don't even enter it into your own minds. Just don't do it. Don't do don't it to think, yourself. I don't guys. even think we'd take him if he was available at 16. <laughs> Me, really? Do you think he wouldn't take CJ Stroud? Mm. Mm. I think a lot of these college offenses. That would be interesting. I think the, a lot of these college offenses are doing the quick and easy way to get immediate success, to get money, dollars into their program and their offenses aren't really geared in helping them in the NFL. And ultimately what's going to happen is you're forcing somebody in expecting a lot when they need time. And those situations never, they typically do not turn out well. Okay. I've got another one here from Tony for you, Scouse. Is there a quality corner or quality offensive line? If sorry, a quality corner or quality offensive lineman is available at 16, which would be the priority for you and why? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, we, we both know that that's the main, the two main areas that we really need to strengthen. Uh, so it's a good question. Personally, I would go corner if my guy is there. Personally. Uh, and, and I think because that's more of a premier position as such. I mean, unless you're going to be drafting a left tackle, but even then, left tackles, rookie left tackles, they take two years to get going. And we need to be winning now. Ron needs to be winning now, otherwise he's going to be gone. So, so from that angle, I'd pick a corner personally. Hi. Um, I I would like to go in any. There's certain ways that you can go about doing this in this first round. Um, I would absolutely love if they went offensive line, um, or corner. Uh, typically, I would like would love Devin Witherspoon there at 16, but he did just run a four or five at his pro day. Um, I countered it with a 4-4, four, four, but that kind of worries me a little bit. And these other corners, they're not all saints. They all have weaknesses. So you do have to go come in with that with a grain of salt, and especially those guys on the offensive line. Um, but I'm, 
I would absolutely love to be able to snag up Anton Harrison, Dewan Jones, or Darnell Wright in the first round. If we snag any of those guys up, uh, I'm a happy man. So, Kyle, no, if, 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 so say, for example, you, you picked up uh, Wright, for example, who's purely a right tackle. Um, where would you see him fitting in? As in, like, would he be a guy who's going to be like a swing tackle type of thing, a Lucas type thing at the, at the start? Or are you going to start him, but then where's Wiley go into, 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 into guard? You think yep. that's what you do? Absolutely. Then, so what yeah. I would uh, – Darnell Wright, right tackle, he's solidified, put him out there. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, you kick Cosme either to left guard or right guard. I think he possibly would be better at left guard. He played left tackle in college. So the left side is more natural to him. So I would not mind moving Cosme there and then having Wiley start at right guard. And then let's have a competition for center um, straight up. And let's see who wins it um, because we have some very qu good quality centers. Nick Gates, Tyler Larson, and Chase Ruye coming back from injury. So that's a very quality center group, and that's probably a good place to have a strong base in uh, since we've seen it years past. So uh, I'm really excited because if they were to get one of those guys, I uh, absolutely love it, man. Nice. So no, last one then from Tony is, is, if there's nobody at 16 that they love, should Washington trade down like last year and accumulate picks? For me, that's the answer. Yes, absolutely. If they're bored and their top guys off the board are gone at 16, I think you have to trade back. Problem you've got oh. is you need a trade. You need a trade partner. You know, someone needs to come to the dance. That's why we talked earlier about the smoke and mirrors. Try and Hendon Hooker, these, Hendon Hooker yeah, one. bring these bring these people in. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. or we're going to go like that. I mean, you scouts a couple of weeks ago talked a lot about Bijan Robinson, saying why aren't we pushing it out in the media to say why is Bijan Bijan's our pick? Bijan's our pick to try and get Dallas off the. You know, off the chase to try and, and, try, and, and try and chase and yeah. try and go up. Yeah, play the game, bro. Play the game. I think there's 100%. a lot of smoke. And, this is the month of smoke and mirrors and the month of lies, isn't it? In the NFL, we all know that that's happening um, along there. But yes, Tony, to answer your question, if it was me, I would most definitely trade back if the people on our board are not there. But we're in a position where, as Kyle said before, we can pick the best player available, not need at the moment, which is a good thing. Absolutely. Always a good thing. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. I would love to be able to trade back um, if our guys are going to be there that we feel comfortable and confident with. Uh, just like last season where they traded back with Jahan, they, they traded back because they felt confident that they were going to be able to get Jahan regardless of where they traded back. And so if we're in that sort of position that the guy you really want, that you have circled, that you know is going to be a baller while everyone else poo-poos it, then yeah, I feel really good about trading back. Well, last one, uh, we've got two more questions and that's us done. So Kyle, this one is from the 54th. So shout out to uh, Deuce uh, Red Zone in the Lab podcast. Top quality guy. He's had me on his podcast. I know he was on your show uh, last week. So he's asked, what are the top corners in the draft that would be the best fit for Washington? That'll be the best fit for Washington. First and foremost, it's Christian Gonzalez, uh, just given his natural frame, uh, body of work. He struggled early on in the season last season, but he progressed. He got better. Um, so you always like to see that progression, that something obviously clicked in his head, and that's what you want to bring him in, somebody who's on a kind of high level that's feeling really good about themselves. I feel like Christian Gonzalez could – start at slot right away and then move in in case of emergency. And that's somebody who has helped against the run is not, um, I guess, I guess you could say he's not going to ignore the run. He's going to come up and embrace it. And that's what you kind of need out of that nickel corner. And also he offers the ability of playing go routes perfectly of having that speed flexibility to twist his hips, stay in line with wide receivers. That's going to be pivotal uh, going against in this division. Next is Devin Witherspoon. Um, the funny thing about Devin Witherspoon is just, he's just electric. He just makes plays. He comes, he's a hard hitter when he does hit. But when the ball's around him, he makes plays. And Illinois, that defense is littered with them. Now, there's even guys like Sidney Brown out there who is a nickel back that if you don't get somebody like Devin Witherspoon or Christian Gonzalez that you can bank on that second round, Sidney Brown's the type of dude you could plug in. You feel really good about that Bobby McCain uh, spot being missing now because he's going to plug in and do well for you. So that I feel really good about. Joey Porter Jr. has his limitations, but I feel like the most important opinion on Joey Porter is Jahan Dotson's. So I don't want to like put too much out there because Jahan went against him in practice. He knows how this dude could play on a day-to-day -day basis. And if he says that Joey straps him up, then I trust Joey because Jahan was destroying everybody in mm -hmm. practice last season. Mm -hmm. um, I would feel good about that. But besides that, 
I'm not really into the whole like Kelly Ringo. I'm not into the Brian Branch um, sort of thing. I'd rather go more so to the future. Okay. Last one then, Scouse. So this is from Mike Allen. So big shout out to Mike Allen. He's been on our show, um, always commenting and always giving us questions. If he's still there, do we take Paris Johnson Jr. at 16? Hmm. You really want me to answer that? <laughs> You'd say yeah. <laughs> Did you say yeah, Carl? I mean, uh, I'm a bit. Do, do I have to answer it? <laughs> no. It was, it was my question. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't. No. I, I love the question. It's just I'm not trying to yeah. be disrespectful towards Paris Johnson. Um, I just wasn't yeah. impressed with this film. I feel like Dewan Jones is the best lineman from Ohio State coming out in this draft. Um, he is an absolute monster, sitting at six eight with that huge wingspan. He's very ferocious in the run game where he throws guys down he gets on top of them Paris Johnson you more so see the cloud kind of blocker I'm gonna absorb whatever's coming at me I'm gonna shrug it off try to manipulate it any way I can but then he gets pushed off edge doesn't have good balance and say and then sometimes his hips are just not low enough to where he gets overtopped or and he loses control of his hands where he cannot sustain blocks by getting in there with Dewan Jones being six eight he doesn't have to worry about that because he's a mountain and you can just run the dude over. So with Paris Johnson, I more see him as a guard and I see a trend in what's unfortunate for guys like him and Skaronsky and others and Broderick Jones is that just because they play left tackle in college doesn't mean that they are best fit for tackle in the pros. It's a different game, dude. And uh, so that's where I feel like we are looking at them as tackles and giving them that kind of, admiration to where they would be in that sort of realm where I don't see it that way. Let the jets draft them to be a tackle. He'll be playing guard in two years. You know, that's cool with me. I mean, I mean, how big, how big is his arms? I mean, how long is his arms? Can What's you remember? Hands, are they, are they who, uh, T-Rex hands? Uh, who, Dewan Johnson. Jones? No, Johnson. Johnson. Oh, Paris Johnson. No, yeah. it was Skaronsky who had T-Rex arms. I think, had, yeah, yeah, I think it was 31 and a half. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. Dewan Jones has 38. <laughs> in charms and sitting at six eight you know wow. and that's where he, you know, he is we're gonna be like... using that first round ta like talent on a pivotal player i want it to be the mountain that is that shows it on film that he's ferocious he's not just a teddy bear the dude wants to throw people into the earth and that's the kind of guy that i want getting off the bus first yeah i agree well carl thank you so much for joining us this week we really appreciate it on american takeover month for the one point safety show if you um, just want to shout out your pod and tell people where they can find you if they're not already, if you're not already following Kyle and the boys over at the Burgundy Zone, what are you doing and what rock have you been hiding under? Yeah, Kyle, go ahead. <laughs> no, we're not for everybody, man. And that's, that's completely cool. But I appreciate you guys for having me on. Um, you guys have stuck with it. You've been consistent with the pod. Um, it's really hard for people to start podcasts and be consistent with it and put a lot of work into it. But you guys have, you've progressed. Look at your backgrounds. You know, you didn't start out with that. And it's really important that you guys are starting with the base and starting with people that are watching your show and you're actually integrating with them. You're communicating with them. And it's really good what you have built so far. And I know that you are just at the beginning, guys. But just because where you're beginning doesn't mean that's where you're going to end. Right. So keep doing what you're doing. You guys are doing an incredibly good job. You can follow us at the Burgundy Zone. Just type it in Google, YouTube, whatever. Um, not that big of a deal, but I just wanted to tell you guys, you're doing a great job. And you guys are coming on the podcast, Scott, Andy, <laughs> I promise. You're coming on the podcast. You just got to trust me that I'm going to put you in the best position possible. And we'll see you uh, in September, mate. We'll yeah, be I appreciate again. it, man. Appreciate it. Of course, boys. I can't thank you guys enough for the invite. It truly was an honor to be able to do it. I got excited when you sent me the invite to my wife right away. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Don't know what that was. Off. It's still recording. It